Hi, my name is Tim Musig. I am the current executive director at JB Prince Company, and today I'm going to show you how to pick the pan that's right for you. When looking for a pan, you should really ask yourself a few questions. What do you like to cook? How many people you're cooking for? And probably the capacity of your stove or your oven. One of the more common or popular shapes in cookware are fry pans. A fry pan typically has an elongated handle, a significant surface area for you to sear food in, and generally flares out. The flaring is what allows for some steam to escape for browning of food. It's also used when you want to toss or manipulate product, maybe without using a utensil, with a kind of simple flick of the wrist. Now keep in mind that size is important depending on what it is that you're cooking. In most situations, you don't want to overcrowd a pan and you also don't want to have too much negative space. Volume is key. In this pan that's here in front of me, that's about an eight inch pan, typically used for maybe a single, possibly two smaller appetized portions of a protein or something to that effect. The one next to me would probably comfortably fit maybe three portions of a protein. You can cook identical foods in them, but again, it's in relation to the volume, what it is that you need to cook. In some situations, it might even be ideal to have two smaller pans rather than one large pan. And if you aren't able to meet the pan's actual capacity, you could wind up in a situation where that section of the pan becomes too hot and you could get some scorch or some discoloration. There are also regional differences in the shape of a fry pan. The one here is kind of more typical of what you would see, I guess, in American households and American kitchens. The one on this side here is a Lyonnaise, or a shape that's inspired from Lyon. Less surface area on the bottom, the diameter of the actual cooking surface is slightly smaller, and it flares out quite a bit more. The reason this is, is so when you're browning product, you have a lot more of, of moisture releasing, aiding the browning process. If you were searing exclusively, this might be a great benefit to have that additional flare. Whereas this one, if you look, the outside diameter and the, and the base are pretty close. You get a little bit more bang for your buck in terms of surface area, and this one you get the added benefit of more moisture coming off of the pan. In front of us we have two saucepans. They're great for heating up sauces or any kind of liquids. And in the restaurant world, there tend to be a lot on the smaller side because we're heating up sauces a la minute. But at home, you may want something a little bit bigger. Another thing to consider when you're electing cookware is the output of the burners in your home. You generally want to match the diameter of your pan as close as possibly to the size of the burner. The cost of the material may come into play. So if you wanted to have something or not necessarily spend as much money on it, don't feel too bad about it. You may want to shift those dollars into fry pans where the material becomes a little bit more relevant in terms of cooking or contact with food. For me, a saute pan is an interesting combination between a traditional saucepan and a fry pan. Unlike a fry pan, the sides on a saute pan are much straighter or almost meet the base at 90 degrees. And when adding liquids or stirring, It'll contain the liquid and you'll have less of a mess on your hands. The saute pan here is gonna be beneficial when you wanna concentrate liquids or evaporate flavor. And the saucepan should be better at preserving or keeping those liquids and maintaining temperature. In this particular case, we're gonna use a saute pan. The increased surface area allows you to put liquid in there and help you concentrate flavors and evaporate liquid more rapidly. A lot more steam coming off of the saute pan meaning that there's a, the reduction has begun to happen a lot more quickly. Things are boiling in there. Uh, the other distinct difference between a fry pan and a saucepan is that you have similar diameters in the base and the top. It gives you maximum surface area and, and points of contact when you're actually frying something. When you're shopping for or looking for a pan, these are things you consider. Do you tend to do more dry cooking with less liquids? Do you wanna have something that's a little bit more of a hybrid? These are all important factors in getting the most effective product for your needs. Another feature or add benefit when using a saute pan is for you to be able to use a lid. Remember, you're being able to add moisture to this pan in a greater volume than you normally would with a fry pan, so using a lid is perfectly acceptable. <laughs> Another tip for when you're shopping or looking for cookware is if you can find a common diameter amongst pans. What that will allow you to do is pick a lid that's somewhat universal. The French refer to as a saute or a rounded bottom saucepan. It has a unique feature where it's kind of a rounded shape between where the base and the sides of the pan meet. It allows you to get a tool, like a whisk, insert it into that corner there to make sure that you're getting maximum contact with the pan and moving product around efficiently. 
The benefit of this is in other situations where you're working in a traditional saucepan, you may leave some product behind, it may not efficiently get scraped out of the corners, and you can get some things that burn or scorch in that process. Here we have a rondeau. It's kind of like the big brother to the saute pan. It's for situations that need a little bit more capacity than a saute pan, or when you're not gonna be, maybe be shaking or manipulating or tossing the food as much. Great for shallow frying, great for searing, and great for braising. This pan would be used in situations where you may start with a sear and need to add a liquid and then a lid. If you tend to be cooking a lot, need to cook in a certain volume and like braises or stews, this could be a good option that gets you in between half stock pot and a larger fry pan. You'll often hear the term skillet, usually associated with cast iron. In essence, it's a variation or another name for a fry pan, or they fall into the same category or family. This particular one has some interesting features. Because cast iron skillets tend to be relatively heavy, they have an added helper handle on the opposite side for lifting. Handles also tend to be a little bit on the shorter side in cast pieces because they are integral to the actual pan. And these ones have some unique pour spouts on each side. As they tend to be slightly deeper than fry pans, with a little bit less of an ability to toss, simply because they're too heavy to do that with anyway. The next pan I have here is a crepe pan. Very, very, very specific. Not something you necessarily need to add to your repertoire unless you love to make crepes. A fancy pancake, if you will. Uh, I think some French guy is gonna beat me up for saying that. You could use it for other things as well. Store-bought tortillas that you maybe want to heat up, this might be a good option for you. Another very specific piece of kitchen cookware is wok. Wok cooking is prevalent in Chinese or Asian cooking. The heat that you need to adequately heat a wok is something that's typically not available to in your home. You may want to try and adapt some of those recipes or techniques to your standard fry pans. Wok burners have a tremendous amount of control and variance of heat. I've seen them cranked up as high as where they're actually almost hitting the edges. It's that ability to get it super, super hot that makes it as effective as it is. Wok cooking is also very active. When people cook with woks or people who do it well are moving food around constantly constantly, and the utensils they use inside this round shape accommodate that movement. In front of me is another variation of a wok that looks like it's been manipulated to work on a home stove. The bottom seems to be a little bit flatter, wooden handles on each side to accommodate heat transfer, and it has this helper handle on the opposite side for when you may need the added lifting power. There's some discoloration along this side here. That discoloration looks like it was formed by kind of overheating and too much oil that was built up here. It's actually the signs of probably a bad break-in process on a carbon steel wok. This wok that we have in front of us has a non-stick coating inside, something I would never recommend. Wok cooking is meant to be done at a really high heat. Non-stick coatings are really not friendly to high heat. The marriage here just doesn't make sense. Just because it's made that way doesn't mean it's good or you should necessarily buy it. We've covered but a few different shapes and sizes in the cookware world. There's many more. This was just an introduction to what we thought was necessary and practical to get you started. Certain cookware is very task specific and costly. So make sure you're picking pans or cookware that's right for your needs. If you're not going to be making things in a tajin you don't need to buy one. Another thing to look at and consider when you're looking at pans is how handles are attached. In this particular pan, they're riveted. A rivet is basically a mechanical fastener of sorts. They work well because they allow you to have a good, sturdy, strong handle. And additionally, they allow manufacturers to mix metals. A lot of pans will transfer heat into the handle, and sometimes a manufacturer will intentionally pick a material that's less conductive to heat so to keep you a little bit safer. With that being said, I always recommend that you use some kind of protective thing like a dry towel or an oven mitt. This particular handle is a flat construction. It's something that I actually prefer. It gives you a firm grip and allows the pan to stay firm in your hand without tweaking to the left or the right when you pick it up. Another little added interesting feature, they punch out a little bit of material here, which again reduces the heat transfer into the handle. This pitch like this is really kind of beneficial for saving you a little space. If you were to crank it down here, just it would probably come out to here, which professional situations makes a big difference. Another way of fixing handles to pans is with welds. Welds are actually traditionally stronger than rivets. They generally are smoother finished on the inside, making it more sanitary. There's no place for kind of bits to accumulate. You should always look for a pan that has a significant amount of welds to make sure it's fixed on properly and stays there. I've seen as few as one 
which uh, I don't recommend. This particular handle is a hollow stainless steel handle. Not really my favorite shape because it's rounded. They did do something that's interesting that I haven't seen on a lot of rounded handle pans. They've put a small indentation on the front side and the back side to give you a place for your thumb to firmly rest so when you are tossing or manipulating food, it feels a lot more secure in your hand. Another technique used to fix handles is with a mechanical fastener like a screw or a bolt. You tend to see this in cost-effective or budget cookware. I simply don't recommend it. If that screw loosens or fails, there's a high likelihood you're gonna hurt yourself. Another thing that you will see from time to time is one-piece construction where there is no fasteners for the handle. This is actually a carbon steel construction and you notice it's completely seamless and fixed all the way through with one piece. Also notice this one is done in a flat style as well. Again, making it a little bit more comfortable or less prone to tweaking in your hand. There's probably a higher likelihood of a heat transfer from the body into the handle on these one-piece constructions, hence the cutout and the vent. But again, keep in mind, no matter what cookware you're using, you should always protect your hands with some kind of dry side towel or oven mitt. Some handles are not necessarily friendly to heat. A lot of inexpensive pans have plastic handles which you never want to put into the oven. Some handles like this one actually have inserts or covers that fit over the handle, which may be appropriate for the oven, but in the case of open flames or if it comes exposed to an actual gas stove, they could melt and it could be kind of gross and toxic. Because stainless steel by itself tends to be a relatively poor conductor of heat, they're generally married to some other materials. They can do it with a sandwich bottom construction, where they actually fuse or add a disc to the bottom of the pan. This is a sandwich of stainless steel, aluminum, and then the stainless steel body itself. That brings more heat to the base of the pan and gives you better heat retention or higher heat at the cooking surface. The other is a clad construction. And what that basically means is that there is this identical material from the base all the way to the top. Nothing's fused or added. This is actually five layers of material that alter between aluminum and stainless. And there's also some ferrous or magnetic material in here to make this induction friendly or ready. The material used in this pan is the same thickness and same density from top to bottom. There's no variation. In a sandwich bottom, the thickness is just here at the base. But that density of aluminum or that thickness allows for great heat retention and also lowers the cost of a pan. So it's kind of an economic or a good value point for a quality stainless piece. The one thing that you have to be cautious of in sandwich bottom construction is if you begin to send heat beyond the disc, you may experience some scorch between that disc and the actual pan itself. So be careful to control your flame if you elect to buy this style of cookware. When you're talking about clad cookware, they'll generally offer millimeters and thicknesses. A rule of thumb is that most quality clad stainless steel cookware starts at around 2.5 millimeters. Picking it up and feeling it are good indicators of the quality because weight and density are an important factor in that. A pan that's heavier or has more mass is a better retainer of heat. One of the reasons why people love cast iron so much. The more dense the pan is or the heavier it is, it generally takes longer to heat and on the opposite side, longer to cool. When it's time to clean up, you have to let it come down in temperature. In front of me, I have an aluminum fry pan. It's around eight inches. Really, really common in the restaurant industry. Aluminum is a good option for value. It has great conductor of heat. It's also lightweight. Its cons are it tends to be reactive, it can spot, and at high heat, it'll misshapen. This pan is great for someone who's just starting out and looking for a good value and performance. Aluminum pans are made in a variety of shapes and sizes. You'll see stock pots, fry pans, rondeaus. There's a process called anodizing, which is a basically a hardening of aluminum. It'll add a black color to the aluminum. It'll make it less reactive and also add a little bit of a better heat exchange because of that dark coloration. Anodizing is probably worth the extra investment for the longevity. In my experience, if you take care of your cookware, it should treat you well for an extended period of time. Stainless steel is fantastic for mostly reasons related to maintenance. It's extremely durable, it resists rust, and is very easy to maintain. Its downsides is that it's typically not a great conductor of heat. In most cases of better cookware, it's usually blended with another material to enhance its thermal conductivity 
and make it a better vessel for cooking in. So what would happen in terms of poor heat conduction is that it's very spotty and blotchy, so you won't have a good even heating surface. So there could be a situation that you put a protein into your pan and there may be a side that is actually cooking faster than the other side, which is obviously something that you don't want. You're always looking for even and consistent heat when cooking. Stainless steel is the universal cookware in the sense that anything can go in it. It's not reactive. Stainless steel is the most dishwasher friendly of all the materials. Keep in mind that stainless steel doesn't mean that it will never rust. one very important point that you always have to remember in any cookware that you use. Before you clean it, let it cool. And if you can, you should wash all of your cookware by hand. If you could towel dry or remove as much moisture as humanly possible from your pan, that's also a great idea. Any water on any metallic surface for an extended period of time, you run the risk of rust. The one on my left hand side is one that has never been used before. Out of the box, the blackened one has been broken in over an extended period of time, makes the pan naturally non-stick. Carbon steel pans are very well suited for searing. Carbon steel pans tend to come to heat faster than cast iron pans, which are thicker material. In addition, the break-in period for carbon steel pans is generally quicker because the surface is smoother. The simplest way to force a patina or to get the pan to be blackened is by warming it and rubbing it with very, very thin coats of oil. I like to do the inside and the outside to make sure the coloration is even, and then put it in a low oven at about 250 degrees for an extended period of time. Remove it, let it cool, and repeat. The more you use it, that color will also come with it. Carbon steel pans are generally very affordable for the durability and longevity. They fall somewhere in between the price of aluminum and stainless steel. There is a certain amount of maintenance that in, is involved. If you tend to be the kind of person that wants to get in and out of the kitchen fast, this may not be the right cookware for you. And I'm about to break one of my own cardinal rules to demonstrate something. We're gonna saute some onions and add some acid to it. What probably will happen is that there will be actually some of the pan patina We'll pull into the onions and discolor them. Put in some lemon in here. This pan is pretty well broken in, has a pretty strong patina, but I just squeezed literally probably the equivalent of about a teaspoon. It's starting to actually strip out some of the patina in this area here. I'm 100% sure it'll have a pretty gross and metallic taste. The acid is not friendly to the kind of polymerization of the patina that you've built up on this pan, and it actually kind of breaks it down. You're stripping it away with the, with the acid, in essence. The lesson here is if you're going to be making pan sauces or you're gonna be using acids or kind of reductions, carbon steel is probably not for you. In front of me we have a cast iron skillet or fry pan, probably one of the more iconic materials in cookware. As a material, it's really not a great conductor of heat, but because it's generally made so dense and so thick, allows you to develop and hold heat for an extended period of time, which makes it great for searing. It's also a great option if you want to go from stove to oven. It is also reactive with acidic foods. The maintenance of cast iron is similar to carbon steel. It is definitely not dishwasher friendly. If it's not dried and handled appropriately, it will tend to rust. Because of its durability, it tends to last an extremely long time. If you were to buy a brand new cast iron pan, you can do it very, very inexpensively. There are certain brands in cast iron that have become highly collectible. I think Lodge Pieces from a certain period, there's another company called Erie and Griswold that will go for hundreds of dollars at auction. So in front of us, we have a cast iron enamel Dutch oven. And in essence, what that is, is a cast piece that's been coated with a ceramic or an enamel coating. It allows you to cook with reactive foods. It reduces the amount of rust that could occur in the pan and just a little bit more user friendly. The coating doesn't necessarily make it around this entire lip here. It's, this is actually exposed cast iron. So if you were to put it into a dishwasher, you would wind up having rust. They put these dimples on here so water returns back into what it is that you're cooking. Cast iron enamel is super easy to maintain. All you have to do is let it cool, use a mild detergent, and wipe it out. This particular cast iron enamel piece happens to be a Dutch oven, but it is available in different shapes and sizes. Copper cookware is a classic material for making pots and pans. You see it often hanging in very, very classic French restaurants. It gets hot fast and it keeps heat even 
which is essential to cooking. Its downsides are that it is highly reactive and very, very difficult to maintain. And lastly, super expensive. I think this is probably like 180 bucks. Just to give you an idea of the degree of maintenance associated with copper, it doesn't stay shiny and beautiful for very long. These are just fingerprints. This was brand new out of the bag. It will get a really strange tinge and color if you don't polish it and take care of it. You see that it's lined with stainless and that material is necessary in order to make the pan usable and not reactive, if you will. And then there's the copper exterior. Once you have copper that has a stainless steel lining, there's no limitations to really what you can cook in it. If you were looking to outfit your kitchen with copper and have a deep collection, it could cost you thousands of dollars. Non-stick is really a reference to a coating, not necessarily the pan's overall material. Non-stick surfaces are common in cookware. In this country, they're often referred to as Teflon, which is, could be a brand name for that coating. In recent times, there's been some bad press related to Teflon. To address this, manufacturers have started to remove the harmful chemicals from non-stick, making it safe again. It's highly recommended if you've purchased your pan before the year 2013 that you should replace it with one of the newer versions where the chemicals have been addressed and removed. Non-stick cookware has also become popular for people who have health concerns and need to use a limited amount of fat in their cooking. Most non-stick pans are generally priced reasonably. They're usually adhered to aluminum pans. Uh, you can see them on stainless as well. I wouldn't recommend making a big investment into a non-stick pan simply because the coatings do tend to fail after an extended period of time. I personally use non-stick for one thing in my house and that's to cook eggs. In front of me, I have two pans, one with a non-stick coating and one that's a traditional straight stainless steel. We're going to add an equal amount of fat to each to try and demonstrate the benefits of a non-stick pan when frying an egg. You notice the stainless, if I just even kind of do a light tilt, even with fat, it's really not going anywhere. Non-stick with like a simple little nudge from a high heat spat here, it'll start to move around pretty easily. And even after I loosen it, it's kind of stuck in place. So I think I'm gonna do something a little dangerous here with the non-stick. I'm already able to flip it. No utensils and no extra manipulation. This bad boy, it ain't going anywhere. He's stuck on there. That's really the benefit of the non-stick pan, especially when you're cooking eggs. It tends to be not so durable under high heat and not last for a particularly long period of time. And it is not recommended for the dishwasher as it will deteriorate from the detergents in there too. Ceramic is used for a substitute for a non-stick coating. It became extremely popular when people had health concerns related to the chemicals in non-stick or Teflon. It is rated at a higher temperature, so you can bring it up to a higher temperature, but its non-stick properties tend to be not as good. So I think they're on or about what non-stick costs, maybe a little bit more. I literally had one for a week, it sucked, and I never used it one again. Literally, that's my, my synopsis of ceramic. The price of cookware is influenced by a variety of different areas. It could be where it's made, it could be the construction, it could be the material. It's very, very important to make sure you have a good understanding of all of those things before you make an investment. Make sure you do your research and you don't overpay or overbuy. You want to buy pans that are appropriate for your needs in your home or in your kitchen. It's not necessarily advantageous to always buy the most expensive cookware. Hopefully the information today will help you pick your next piece of cookware.